رجالاتنا جند ساهر سواحل لا كنز ظاهر سلام الله سلام الله سلام على أهل بلادر السلام عليكم So this is probably the second episode with Sayyidi Abu Banna Abdul Wahab can't make it today you got commitments already So as we're gonna speak about today we're gonna speak about TSS Inshallah TSS is a man called Tahir Sheikh Saeed, right? Yep. And he's a millionaire, tycoon. He lived in, it's from Barawa, but he lived in Mombasa. Mm. If you all know who he, um, if you're from Mombasa, you probably know who he is. Yeah. But the reason why we're going to speak about him is because we're going to highlight the journey after the civil war from the Barawa people they made to go to Mombasa and Malin, the Anamu. With the boats. To seek, boats. Yeah, to seek asylum or seek refuge. So they were fleeing the civil war. And they start trying, they took this journey mm. by boats. By boats, sailing so, boats, yeah, big sailing boats. boats. They were called boats, isn't it? Boats. And they. Uh, so, how do they call them? It's why they call it Jahazi, even as a Barabanese, as we call it uh, Jahazi as well. Mm. So, this is like a big ones, commercial ones. They used to bring it to Baraba, like coffee beans or tea, bar, tea like other stuff, like uh, very useful in Kenya so they used to bring it here and then as well they used to take it from Barawa a lot of stuff trading yeah yeah so it's sort of like trading all right but before we get into that topic let's, let's show them because as tradition before we start a topic we start with a traditional Barawa food and we'll um, talk about it briefly so today yeah, what do I you think, have today yeah I think we mentioned <laughs> this food the special food uh, Baravani special food. We mentioned this be our episode, the, the other one, that we have Mayangamba and Galamudo and other stuff. So today we're going to start with the Galamudo. Galamudo, yeah? Yeah, so Galamudo or the other people, they say Garamudo. So it's the same thing. And I think we mentioned, I mean, we said about Garamudo, how you prepare, how you cook and everything. So, yeah. So we're just going to go through. Galamudo basically is like a pasta. Mm -hmm. uh, it's handmade. Yeah. So what they do is the people in Barawa. It's originally from Barawa. Mm -hmm. So what they do is um they take flour. Yeah. So you know how to mix flour, the recipes and all that. And then mm -hmm. they they will make it um they'll knead it. Yeah. They will cut it in small pieces for pasta, right? mm -hmm. and they'll put it on a those those small pieces. They'll put it on a big basket. Sharafa. Yeah. Sharafa. In sharafa. Yeah. Sharafa is like a hand tailored um straw mat basically, isn't it? Yeah. That's so why I hate to call it to go. And then this this rafa mm -hmm. is a straw mat. It's a round is one. Round, yeah. A big one. The reason why they put they use this instead is because it's got that air inside the filter. And then to get it dry a little bit. It keeps it really dry. Yeah. So rather than putting it on a flat surface and it makes it, it sticky stick and stick the each other, moisture, yeah. They, they put on the sharafa and then they put like a little cloth on top to cover it. And then they put, it. yeah. And then they use more flowers so not to be sticking together. Mm. So when they do with the hands, like when they do with the hands, prepare it, they throw it to the sharafa yeah. and then they put it flour on the top of it so that will not stick in together. After that, they leave it like maybe one hour. It depends like uh, everyone chooses their time. So some people, they leave it just like one hour or two hours. After that, then they start it to cook. Mm. What to prepare. That's, so that's the most important part yeah. of the mood is the softness of it because yeah. a lot of people do this mistake and it becomes really, really hard, isn't it? Yeah. So that's why the sharafa is really important. It's like the main thing to do. Exactly. And this, this is why this is what makes the bula mm. So once they finish after the sharafa, they put in a big pot the and pot. then they boil it with meat inside as well. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's like slow cooking and just wait till it boils yeah. which, and it rises and everything. Which we have the meat here. So it has to be soft as well, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. So that's why they leave it into the, I mean, in Barawa there's no oven, there's no cooker, so they leave it into the thing like a fire for the meat to be really, uh, what's it called, soft and everything, so that you can eat. And it's very flavored as well. The very, pork, yeah. pepper, so a lot of stuff to do to go in there. There's like so much texture it. behind it, and it's, yeah. And this is like um. It's known only in Barawa, right? Mm -hmm. It's not really, I know a lot of rare hammers, they make Lamudo. Yeah. They call it Kalamudo. But it's actually, it's, um, it started off in Barawa. Yes, it and did. Mm. So, I mean, uh, as a food, like, we, we've got, like, international food everywhere. 
like samosa is sort of like international Mahambri. Mahambri. so this garamuda as well when the other people saw like what Ramini they're doing all these garamudo they like it they copy and then they're starting to mm. do it and it became like more widely open because we're so people. we're so connected yeah that's why i heard this realization like mogadishu mm-hmm. will find some of our people there we'll yeah find them in Basa, we'll find them. Yeah. so when you're when you're so like i'm um, into mixing yeah you learn from each other of course and yeah. the culture you start picking up it becomes so fluid and then mm-hmm. you start eating and then the dishes which are shared mm-hmm. but yeah so that's galamudo yeah so now uh, should we start should we start the um our topic so yeah. so uh, after the civil war in 1990, yeah. Yeah. a lot of people in Somalia had to move this Somalia, they had to leave and seek refuge somewhere else. True. To seek asylum. Yeah. And the journey for mm-hmm. um, the journey for the Barawa people they took was mm-hmm. mainly because they live in the coast. True. For them to take that journey by boat to go mm-hmm. to Mombasa, let's yeah. emphasize on that. Yeah, I mean um I would say like it was like a dark days and sad days around that time when was the civil war in uh, Somalia because civil war started in the capital Mogadishu as I remember like yesterday I was in the school I was on the high school third class so it was only one year to go to uni or to go to high college so when we were in the school it, it was started around five o'clock in the afternoon or just like four to five in the afternoon that way started the civil war and everyone has to run the next day we were in Mogadishu still there and then after that those people who used to be in Mogadishu the Baravanese people who used to work in Mogadishu and everything started to go back to Barawa because it was just like a mess everywhere and everyone was scared and a lot of people became like uh, obsessed with the uh, steel and everything so we left a lot of Baravanese left and went uh, to Barawa so that that I mean that civil war went like uh, one month just before the Siad Bari li- leave the, the place after that it was a little bit down and then after that it started again so but mainly that we are here to talk about is about us as a Baravanese how in i mean how affected us the civil war and everything so after a while barawa was full of all baravanese they came from everywhere just to stay and look up look after each other so but, that, at that time mm. like, like in that time there was no like phones or email you cannot really no. let someone know no so it to was, hear what's going on in Mogadishu you have to hear it from people that are coming from Mogadishu exactly and when exactly. They, by the time you hear about it you can't even really arrange to leave because it's all happening so fast and you have to yeah. pack your stuff and go isn't it true true but they knew they're coming now because they're, 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 they're the militias that time they were going yeah. from cities to cities taking over it's Kenya. true yeah so they knew to come to Barawa and mm-hmm. they have to quickly yeah but the thing is like one thing like the he, us as a Baravanese that we wasn't I mean we were not expected what happened in Barawa because what happened in Barawa is not just like looting or this war or anything it happened like personal stuff it happened like uh, after looting it became like people getting scared and those militias came to the houses knocking the doors and starting to even raping people so that's the time was really a sad and dark days, dark times in Barawa. And I remember all the girls and ladies were rushed to the mosque to be saved because these militias, they starting to just do all this atrocity, catastrophic stuff that people can bury. So that's why people starting to take all the girls and the ladies to the mosque just to get refuge and to get peace there and then after that it's just like starting these boats the first boat came from Mombasa they came brought us something because they were on the ocean when they started all this stuff so they didn't know what's going on in, uh, in, in Barawa at that time luckily they came and uh, I'm not sure whether they whatever they brought it they I mean they put it out or not 
they came and the people were just distress and fear and everything. So they said, we're going to take this boat to get refuge anywhere before it became worse. So that's why I started the, the journey with the boats, sailing boats to Mombasa. And why we choose Mombasa? Because this, first of all, the sailing boat came from Mombasa and the Mombasa was, there were a lot of Baravanese there, of businessmen, other people who moved from Barava for a long time, descended in Mombasa, which they were originally from Barava, so that's why he started that journey to straight to Mombasa. So the first boat, it was just like everyone who can afford it, to be honest with you, because it wasn't free the first boat. Those people who afforded to get that boat to flee, they did it. And some of them they could they had no wealth to pay, they started giving exactly. them gold. Whatever they had, wherever they them. had, just to trade it and get out from there. Don't forget, a lot of the things were stolen already. Yeah, they all looted. Most, yeah, so the house was all empty. So, so like their stories were a lot of them women they used to hide their gold. They used to dig it. And dig then, it inside. Yeah. Some people they used to hide it in the toilet. Some mm -hmm. people they dig it grounds. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stories. When, when the boats, when, when the boats came, they took what like the lot of gold they had yeah. to, to use it as. Mm. To, to yeah. get out of the country. Yeah. Talking about, I mean, gold, some people they couldn't even, I mean, they didn't have that time. They were just like uh, confused, they were just like uh, all this kind of stuff, depressed and everything, stressed. So they couldn't do, they couldn't concentrate anything. Some people they left all behind mm. because they just wanted just to come out to save their lives. It was really bad, bad days and bad times at that time. So as I said, like the first boat, whoever can afford it, when took it and that boat went to 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 Mombasa. And as I remember, as I I mean, I wasn't there in that boat, but I've heard that boat was about two hundred people or more for that boat inside there. So and uh, one of the person who were in that boat was the mayor of Barawa. They call it Mama. So he was there and when the boat went to Mombasa, the, the, the old port, those people in Mombasa, the businessmen, the politicians or other people, they came to there because they heard that the, there's a boat came from uh, Barawa. And there was some stories about Somalia started the civil war and everything. So they went there to see what's going on because as you said, there were no mobile phones, no WhatsApp, nothing to record it. So they went straight to the to the port and uh, see what's going on and ask the people. And that boat it came around uh, eleven, I think, as a as a, as a idea. Eleven at like eleven at the night. And they couldn't do anything till the next morning. So the next morning, because the authority in Kenya, they said, we can't take out the people from the port at that time, so they have to wait the next day. That's a good, and even said that's go back as well, isn't it? Some yeah. stories. Some stories, yeah, because they were fed up. They were scared. They were just like, imagine like you've never been in the ocean. You've never been in that boat. And that well. day, you just take that boat just to save your life. And into the ocean, you'll be there like for 10 days. Imagine, how is it? And then when you come to the port to, to dock at the boat, I mean, you have to stay there. So, yeah, yeah. But it was a lot of uh, experience. Like I have this um, mm. educational resource pack, resource pack for, written by um, Bana Funzi. Mm -hmm. Bana Mohammed Sheikh, um, Mohammed Bana Funzi. No, Bana Mohammed Saidi. Saidi Bana Funzi, just yeah. filmed him in it. Yeah. So he wrote this. Mm -hmm. He's like he wrote it as an educational res um, resource pack, pack yeah. for parents, teachers, and professionals. For the yeah, for the yeah. And then he mentioned briefly about the journey from the yeah. boat mm -hmm. it took. He yeah. said these boats were so like packed and were so True. full, mm -hmm. like mothers and children, and a lot of people died in the journey. Yes. To get there. Yeah. Because as he said, it's the first time going on a boat, and um, then you're in the boat for ten days. For ten and days. It's all pitch black, dark, and then mm -hmm. you're in this motion. Yeah. People are diarrhea. They're Vomiting, yeah, a lot. And some just mm -hmm. didn't make it to, to their destination, isn't it? Yes. And that's it was, as I said, it was like a dark days and yeah. sadness. 
And in some parts, he said that when they reached there, because they came in at that time, they were mm. receiving so many refugees yeah. from Somalia mm. fleeing the civil war. Mm. They, had to, they had no choice but just to send them back. And yeah. these boats had to, they had to go back to the sea and just wait it out. Yeah. What did you think? To get like help mm. someone to convince the authority that they don't have anywhere to go. Even if they go back, they don't know what is in there. Mm. They couldn't go back. And talking about the, about the sailing boat, there is a one boat which is very famous as as our Paravanese, which is the most uh, uh, overcrowded boat was it there because that boat it was just as as we nicknamed it that boat Jazzy of Trumenu. No, yeah. yeah. So it was like that boat. It was the I think it was the second one or the third one. That boat was overcrowded. I mean, it took that boat, I mean, I have, uh, I have uh, for sure that what someone was there, I was talking to someone who was in that boat, and he said to me, it was around 800 people, including children and women and everyone. 800 people, that boat is only for capacity. commercial capacity for 150 to maximum 200 people but this one it took 800 people and it was just like even that boat was most of the people that they they, they said like we don't know where we if we reach to Mombasa or not because it's overcrowded and it was just like chaos everywhere and uh, we was they were scared to come safe to to Mombasa mm. but alhamdulillah thank god they came safe and no one died in that boat, miraculously. But it was the most, I mean, I, I shouldn't say famous, but it was the most atrocity time and that boat was handling very, very, I mean, bad stories. So now let's mention, you see how you mentioned the Barawa business and politicians, and yes. how did they take this now? What was yeah. the reaction when they see yeah. these Yeah, so coming coming back from the first boat when reached to Mombasa at the port, as I said, the business people and all the politicians who are living in Mombasa in Kenya came to the boat and took all the details and everything. And one of them was like uh, this big figure man, Tahir Sheikh Said. They call him TSS. And there's another guy was um, Jumba Nuru. Those two guys, they really put an effort to save Baravanese people. So they said, let's uh, get them. I mean, they were talking about how to save those people that are still stuck in Barawa. So they, they said, we're going to take the boat, another boat, an empty boat to Barawa to take people from there and to bring Mombasa which this one, it was, it helped a lot of people. And that's why the second board or the third board was overcrowded because it was free. It was paid by someone. It was paid by this guy, Tahir Sheikh Said, TSS, and uh, his uh, friend was Mjobanur. So they ordered or they hired a boat, empty one, to go to Barawa and take people bring it to, to Mombasa and that was overcrowded and everything and that boat the second boat or the third boat the one was overcrowded the figure or the person we can mention in that boat was another mayor the former mayor of Barawa which is Nurene Hassan everyone knows him as well he was in that boat as well so and that boat as I've been told it was Ramadani Imagine it was Ramadani, some the people, that, Ramadan. the month of Ramadani, they came, that boat, they came ex exactly the same, like uh, before just Maghrib time. And again, the authority, the Kenya authority, they said, no, you can't take it out the people, they have to wait the next day. So they have to wait the next day, and these guys, those people who are in Mombasa, like TSS and Jomanuru and other people, they really put an effort, they really hard, they try hard to take them, just even a bit of them, because it's 800 people stuck in there, don't know what to do. It was overcrowded, so they tried, but the next day, people they've been taken out from the boat, and uh, kids, and uh, women, and everything, and then after that, from there, 
Tahir Sheikh Saeed, the TSS, had a place in, uh, in the center of uh, Mombasa. He had a big plot with the... Uh, he bought, it was a, I heard somewhere it was a school. And it he, was a school, he exactly. Bought he bought it he and it. he turned it into the camp. Yeah. A refugee camp for these people. So this guy, we have to mention him and we have to praise him and he is yeah, not... It's amazing because you know, in Mombasa, everyone knows who TSS is. Exactly. Even, yeah. even this big building, TSS Tower. He's, 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 he's a very, very, yeah, very, very, I mean, a big guy. Yeah, big business guy. They really know about the good things that he, he did. They don't put the emphasis on the yeah. things he did for Barawa yeah. during, during the time when they yeah. really needed I mean, it. as uh, if I can just take briefly about TSS, he was born in Moyale, 1940. That's where he was born in Moyale in 1940, but he's Baravanese, no doubt about that. And Moyale is north, northeast uh, Kenya. So from 40, when he was young, like in 20 years or like over 20 years, he settled in, in Lamu, where he started the journey and uh, politics and business and everything. When he was in Lamu, he stayed there. Till I mean, he was doing everything in politician, in business, in Lamu, and everything, and he became really good figure and high figure in Lamu, and everyone knows that. And even in Lamu, he's got really big lands and big uh, schools, and he did a lot of things in Lamu as well mm. for best. And after that, in nineties, that he became a higher and higher as a businessman in nineteen nineties. And especially that time where the Barabazis needed help and the civil war and everything, it was that time. It was just becoming higher rank in uh, in Mombasa at that time. He just started spreading himself in Mombasa, Lamu and everywhere. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, where we Barabazis, we got a big, big help from this guy. And me personally, as a Barabazis, I just say like, Thank God this guy, he was alive at that time and we had a Barabanese figure like him to help us and uh, make Allah bless him he all the time. He died, yeah. he's he's, he's, he died in South Africa. He was a heart oh, attack. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he, I mean, he died like, I don't know, about eight, he was 70, 80 years old mm -hmm. at that time. So, But this is the guy, he was a big, big guy at that time, yeah. And there was With a lot of crisis. I mean, at that time, there was a lot of not just Barabanese, but Banadiri millionaires and businessmen that done the same thing. Yeah. Like in, Hamar the, in Hamarun. Yes. I think it was the Rio Okera clan, it was the Indian clan that yeah. lived in Hamarun. Yeah. And their elders, one of their millionaires, did the same thing. Mm -hmm. and we have Bra Okera as well in Barawa. We have Bra Okera in Barawa, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So it was Hamarun, isn't it? Bra Okera living. And they have their own area as well. Mm -hmm. And that one of their millionaires, um, mm -hmm. their business owner, they made a boat. They bought a boat, the ship, and they took it from Mogadishu ports all the way to Mombasa as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to talk about as a minority or anything, but that time it was like everyone For who themselves. are who are businessmen or anything thought about their people, just to bring them into the safe place. Yeah. Then after that, whether the people they decide they will decide to go back or or stay that is another thing but at that time everyone every people who are big figures businessmen and everything even uh, religious people they thought just to save uh, save the lives and then think whether you want to go back or you want to stay or anything that's what they did what's well, well, interesting is look, see the Bravanese when they went to Mombasa yeah it was very easy for them to fit in in that society and that environment yeah, speaking about that one, as we... With the locals, but not the first one. No, or the locals. Because as I said before, there were a lot of Baravanese who used to live in Mombasa that time as well. And even our dialect, as we said before in other episode, our dialect, it is into Swahili. So for us, it became very easy, first of all, in, uh, in the language, and then as our people who used to live in Mombasa helped us as well to go through a lot of stuff, whether it's going to be authority or whether it's going to be just to open some 
shops or anything. So we help each other. And it became easy for us to stay there. Even a lot of people, they, they got like uh, papers, authority papers to stay there for forever and everything, IDs and everything. So it went easy. I mean, I wouldn't say that easy, easy. There were a lot of people, they were struggling in, uh, in, uh, in this place, Jalia. They call it, the, as we said, like TSS, he bought this place like it was a school and he took the people there to live there because a lot of people that didn't have any place in Mombasa to stay, they didn't have money to spend it to rent uh, houses or anything. So this guy, he gave them that chance. And they, that place, they used to call it Jalia. Everyone knows that all Barabanese who went to, to Kenya, they know that Jalia was the based place where all the Barabanese people, when they fleed from Barawa to their first. And then after that, everyone who can so come out to, to rent a house or to get some relatives, they did. But some people, they were staying for long there. There's, a lot, and there's also cases where mm. whenever Barabanese got in trouble with the authority in terms of visa or staying or yeah. anything, yeah. he used to come and build them up yes. to pay for their court. Yes, he did. he did a lot. As I said, like uh, for authority papers and everything for government even as for these guys to cover us to get like uh, papers to do for us and everything so that's why they really play good role mm. i mean best one that would be great yeah well, that's the that's mombasa the, the people mombasa i mean mm. i remember speaking to one of the guys no mombasa sorry malindi yeah he told me how you remember it was it was the middle of the night when the Burmanese came Yes. And a lot of them that had no bags, nothing, no belongings. Nothing. Everyone it's just was fleeing. Gerasi, that's it, covered themselves. Yeah. Some people they just came with their clothes, nothing, nothing on yeah. it. That's why they couldn't do anywhere. They can't mm. they can't go anywhere. They don't have anything. So they have to stay in that jali until they get like way around. Mm. So there's they especially the next one, the one was uh, over eight hundred people, the crowded one. That one 90% of those people they were did I mean they were not planning to go anywhere and they didn't have anything they just flee with their clothes nothing on them so that was really really difficult time but then after a few years they re they settled it was very easy for them to settle in because yeah after a lot of there in the yeah beginning. after that as I said like uh, those people who used to live there before yeah. they help us to walk around uh, to uh, get some get opportunities jobs. any chance any jobs some of them even they start into open shops just to get a little bit independent mm. so I mean, that's why it spread after that slowly slowly even in that place in uh, in Jalia place you I mean it was uh, recognized by even by UN so the United Nations came to Jalia to research to check everything and they were doing a lot of stuff and even some people they go out from Jalia to Europe to America to Australia and in that Jalia there were Arab people mm. they used to live I mean I wouldn't say Arab people they I mean Warabu we call it Warabu in Barawa they used mm. to live with us but they are, they, they are our brothers and sisters yeah. originally from Yemen those people, they were in there as well, in Jali at that mm. time. Mm. After a while, they got help from Yemen authority. Uh, the Yemen authority, they brought a plane yeah. to take them out. So there were a lot of things in Jali happened. Yeah. Okay. And uh, things happened there as well. People, they were just living in like a big hole. It's, it's like a school, but it's like a big hole. They put it just like a curtains, and some of them they put it just like a bit wood to cover to make like a separated room mm. to just to survive. Yeah, just to go through. Yeah, so awesome. that was at that time very hard. But it, I mean, a lot of people and a lot of Barabanese they know about this guy TSS and they know what he did to us, mm. which we are grateful. Mm -hmm. Talking about TSS, I mean, mm -hmm. 
because he was established in Lamu, as you said, and Mombasa. Yeah. And this is the case with a lot of Rwandese people. Mm. They will find large communities. Yeah. And because they used to go there before the civil war to work. Yeah. To, to work. live there to study. Of course. Yeah. In, even like, like um, Garissa, they was there. Mm -hmm. And then further down to yeah. in Lamu, mm -hmm. you see Rwandese people there. So today, yeah. they live there and they, mm -hmm. they were there before the war. They, in of fact, they were like hundred mm. years, isn't it? Two hundred, three hundred. A lot. Mm. A lot that were there. So she like um I think mm. you mentioned everything that needs to be said, isn't it, about TSS? But about, yeah, about the journey and everything. Mm. You can wrap it up then and then Yeah. Hopefully mm -hmm. and that's it, yeah. I hope you all benefited something from that journey from Brother Needs to Mombasa mm. and what went through and well, this is survived. yeah, and this is what we can cover it. So it may be a lot of things needed to be covered, mm. but at the moment we just cover this what we know. There's a so, lot of things to do, but this yeah, is so what we got. Thank you, CJ. No worries. Tanga vitruamba.